I think now that I've, I've um, cracked the seal on my heart and on my experiences talking about these things, uh, I trust that there will be people in my life who've known me for a long time who might be, yeah, sure, they'll be shocked at first. They might be appalled by some of the things that I'm saying. They might not want to talk to me for a minute. But I trust that some of them will come around and they'll say, hey, you know, I, I was thinking about what you said and A, B, C, X, Y, Z. I've been thinking about this conversation a lot and how to sort of, how do I want to position myself? What is, what are the objectives in mind? And what always comes up for me is the objective should not be winning. It shouldn't necessarily even be bringing someone over to your side. It's simply getting at some consensus on truth. So thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Is there somebody you have in mind or is it just like a mindset of people with whom you, inter you interact? I would definitely say, and, and thank you for having me, by the way, it's typically a mindset. Um, I do find the situations that I run into this most often are on set. So it will be my colleagues, other, other professionals. Well, what is the mindset? I would best describe it as um, a series of assumptions. I would say they seem to deal with people such as myself from my background as abstracts rather than as human beings. And they'll suddenly start talking about, oh, you know, the black experience, which I think is this all-encompassing, <laughs> ridiculous right. notion. Because again, I'm an individual. They'll talk about, it, you know, black people are so afraid to go outside and deal with the police and no one stops and asks me for my opinion or to ask if that's true. And I feel compelled to respond even though I can't, you know. So I usually stay quiet. So when you're talking about giving people opportunities based on their gender, based on their skin color, their culture, it's, it's tricky for me also because like I am a 42 year old white male who's had a lot of opportunities potentially that it's hard to say whether it just came out of sheer will and work. Those opportunities might not have been available to me if I was, you know, a black man from Tennessee or a black woman from Atlanta. I think that you should set the goal of instilling doubt, giving them the gift of doubt. I like that. I like that too. And it's easier to do than you would imagine. The first principle I'd like you to try is never make a statement, always ask a question. One of the things that comes up for me is first off, have we even ever as a culture had a conversation around the actual benefits of diversity? I mean, does it really make an organization better to have a diverse staff just intrinsically? And I'm talking about the token diversity of skin color and gender and things of that, that nature. If everyone has the same bloody skill set, what difference does it make? Yeah. Do people get a chance? I, I understand that. Do people get a chance, though, to get that skill set if they're not given the opportunity? I think is the reality like that a lot of people don't get the opportunity like you're extremely talented like and i hope people don't hire you based on what the only thing i can think of is out of pity essentially um but but i do think that there's certain innate things that happen in this country specifically the united states that prevent people from getting to a position where they can actually be and have the same talent that like everyone else in the organization might have. You always want to make sure that they don't have a defensive posture. Once someone has a defensive posture, they'll double down in their beliefs. This is counterintuitive. And I've found that very smart people have difficulty with this. Don't bring up any evidence. Okay. No evidence. Huh. It elicits the backfire effect. No statistics, nothing. 
Well, why are we assuming that someone who has a skin tone like mine necessarily comes from a, a position of underprivilege? Because I, I, I certainly didn't. I grew up upper middle class. Oh, yeah. And... No, I think it's mostly just a, that's just the easiest term for the, our viewing audience to, or like easiest like thing to identify quickly. So, right. I mean, we could go through all of the like various forms of things that the U.S. has done to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. different sects of people throughout the globe uh, sure. as far as like stamping them down and not giving them a chance to like perform well but yeah right right and, and i get that i there's i think this is something i find myself really strongly disagreeing on because i mean certainly compared to what i mean compared to um sierra leone you know it's just like i feel like um you know if, if i if i'd been born there i would not have the opportunities that i've had in the u.s circling back to um you know this this idea of the appeal to history um, that's something that always kind of gets my back up a bit because I think to myself, okay, yes, this country has the history that it has, but if you go far enough back into history, you're going to get the same perpetual cycle of colonialism and slavery everywhere you go. It's just different human beings doing it to other different human beings. And so what is unique about the United States that makes that so pernicious that we have to have a completely different mindset around opportunities here? So if women, for instance, are being constantly denied a place at the table, it's very hard for me just coming from where I, and watching my mother struggle her entire life, being denied like raises and being denied certain positions in a company, like part of me wants to rectify that. And I don't know if that's the right way to go about it. Um, like, I would love your opinion on it, actually. But it's just something like it's innate in me where it's like I, now I feel like that if I can be a part of assisting and changing that, I want to be. When you have these conversations and someone's saying something to you, here's a simple thing you can do. It's a little geeky, but it's unbelievably effective for making you better. You just ask people right. to put the belief on a scale. Okay. Doesn't matter what it is. That's really interesting. I'm curious, how confident are you in that belief on a scale from, from one to 10? So once you do that, you can then immediately ask a disconfirmation question. Under what conditions would you go from a nine to an eight? Mm -hmm. What would you have to learn to bring you down to an eight? Um, just building off what you, you, what you were saying, I mean, you, you're sharing your mother's experience. Um, I don't know if, if you can give me a, a decade or a time frame when this was. So the 70s through okay. the 80s. 70s through yeah. the 80s. Okay. So putting it on a scale. Um, okay. We're talking about the 1970s, 1980s. Um, clearly there's a long period of time that's passed since then. On a scale of one to 10, how... Uh, prevalent do you think that remains now? It doesn't affect me like it might affect someone else. So my mother might say that it's gotten better and it's like a six out of 10 if we're gonna, if 10 being the worst. 10 being the worst, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and me, I might be like, oh, I see like actually a lot more opportunities today. We have a female vice president. We had a female run for president. Like. Et cetera, et cetera. Like, so, you know, like maybe a four out of 10. So perspective oriented though, I don't know if it's the truth, but yeah, sure. Let's say for me, diversity hiring, the problem of, I mean, I still think seven out of 10. Okay. And why do you think you're not a six? Interesting. Um, I think only because I've seen it affect people so much over like my life. And also because, I mean, I do work in an or like an industry that like historically has mostly been men and f for a hundred years, mostly white men. I think you could acknowledge the past. I think you have a duty to acknowledge history, but you also have a duty to attain some self-actualization. And, and move forward. Do you think um, that it's possible that people haven't let black Americans move on? That like they were more ready to let like the Japanese Americans, the Chinese Americans, like people who were also like marginalized and even enslaved at some point in the US like to move on, but that like the rest of the country and the culture of the US just hasn't allowed 
black America to move forward? Or do you think it's actually black America preventing itself from moving forward? I think there's some aspect of both going on. I, th I think that there is a degree to which uh, the black American culture has, has very much entrenched itself in the narrative of slavery, in the victimization. But I also think there's a degree to which that's been encouraged and exploited by the culture, certainly um, right. by the more, shall we say, liberal progressive uh, culture, which profits off of that victimization um, as a way to buttress its own power and its own wealth. There's this idea of black authenticity, and and it's it's a concept that really arose out of the civil rights era in the 1960s, that there's an authentic black experience and my experiences do not arise out of a racial category. They're just things that, I, that have happened to me as I've moved through the world. And so therefore there are gonna be people who look at me and say, well, he doesn't get it. He's never had those experiences. Therefore he's not authentically black. And therefore out of hand, his opinion can be dismissed. And I think the, the authentic experience is the experience of the individual. I, I do not agree that there is such a thing as an authentic black experience or an authentic white experience or anything else. I think that the experience of the individual is what matters first and foremost. And, and that is the realm in which we should be having these conversations, not as, not as some collectivized identity category. What drives you to wonder the facts around police brutality and African Americans specifically? Yeah, I, th I think what, what drives me to ask that question really is fundamentally my own spidey sense that goes off, which is just, okay, whenever someone brings up the racial question, I feel like I'm being manipulated. And I, and I recognize that's not an argument. That's, that's really, that's pathos, not logos. Right, that I'm that I'm coming from, but I'm instantly looking out for the for the manipulation because of the the degree to which the media seem to constantly harp on the issue of police brutality having an intrinsically racist component, and I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. Of course, it does, but the broader questions around police brutality as a whole, as it affects citizens of the United States, seems to be lost in the fog of the racial component. I think that's my motivation for asking. Right. Do you think it has to do with the fact that more black Americans experience police brutality than any other group? I, well, I wonder if it's, if it's a fact that blacks experience more police brutality. Because surely, if whites are the majority of the, of the country, they're going to have more interactions with the police just by virtue of having a larger population set. Um, but the degree to which those engagements are necessarily more or less brutal, I'm, I'm not sure how that can be quantified. Can I throw out uh, an idea that maybe yeah. might be worth talking about? So I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the economist Roland Fryer. Uh, he happens to be black and he was looking at the numbers, and his work did find that black and Latino suspects, particularly men, tended to be roughed up more, but actually shot less. So whites tended to be killed more, interestingly. And he said that that was the most bizarre finding, and he did not expect it at all. There's something I can just add to that real quick. Yeah. Um, I guess bringing, bringing it back to two specific instances, and, um, and Eric, I'd be curious to know what you think about this. There's the narrative around what happens to George Floyd, which uh, obviously was absolutely horrifying and despicable and should never have happened. At the same time, there is a lesser known case of a white gentleman in Texas named Tony Tempa who died the same way. That did not garner any media coverage whatsoever. There certainly weren't riots about it. So the specific circumstances in which they died were so similar that they could be discussed in the larger context of police brutality as a whole that everyone in the population potentially could find themselves subject to in the right set of circumstances. Right. And yet the way it was discussed had this racial overtone in the case of George Floyd. Right. Yeah. And I think that's mo and this I could be proven wrong, but from what I, if I make an assumption about what's happening, it would be that the person, I don't know how many 
percentage of white people you're talking about, Travis, when you say like, were killed? It, so, it, it was proportional to the crimes committed. So it's all proportional, okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I, I can't imagine if more whites are killed by police wrongly that that doesn't come up more often. It's really, it's difficult for me to understand. The question would be why do the police murder black men? Mm -hmm. Why do they murder anybody? Mm -hmm. I guess is the question. The secret to this whole thing is that you have to be willing to revise your, your own beliefs. Mm -hmm. If you are willing to revise your own beliefs, if you're actually sincere about that, every attempt that you have to instill doubt will be magnified by 10,000, your effectiveness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's something that people have that they can just pick up on that. Mm. While I understand the history uh, in this country pursuant to policing, I'm very much uh, of the mindset that we need to eliminate race from the discussion as much as we possibly can and just get back to dealing with each other as human beings and dealing with the root causes of violence in certain communities around the, around the country. You think yeah, race probably. has taken over too much of the discussion? I think so. I think so. Do you think that there might be a reason that that's true? Like, I do. I, I, think, I think it's taken over too much of the discussion because there are people who benefit and profit off of it. And I'm talking mainly about politicians and I'm talking about yeah. people um, you know, in high uh, profiles within society who profit from the grievance industry and they profit from the cycle of victimization that, uh, that we're seeing in the culture. Right. Do you think it's also possible that it includes because there are a large number? I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. Let's assume, let's, or you can prove me wrong, please. But do you think that there's a large number of white nationalists that end up in the police force? I don't think it's an overwhelming majority. I really don't. I've had a lot of positive interactions with police. I've had some negative ones too, but I've never been in a situation where I felt in danger uh, simply by coming into contact with a cop. It's very easy to have moral and ethical considerations around how policing should be done, but unless we ourselves are actually in those situations, how, how can we possibly believe that we could react differently? even if we have the best of intentions and the best training. I had assumptions about how he was gonna broach certain subjects and in some cases I was 100% wrong and I think it's great that I was wrong. It helped me try and I guess just consider what I believed more and what I wanted more out of society and yeah, it, it, I just didn't really, I guess I didn't expect him to have that sort of take on brutality and murder as regards to black Americans, um, black male Americans especially. But it was like, it, it, again, that's just because I had probably like prejudices about how he would react. I think Eric has a, such a degree of self-awareness that um, he, he was able to approach the conversation with curiosity in mind. And unfortunately, in my experience, that's just, it's been very rare because anytime I've tried to engage people about these issues, they are not curious about my position. They're not curious about my experiences. They're so heavily rooted in their dogma and they will defend it to the death. And it seems rather unwarranted. And I, I think that's, that's part of why I've just kept so quiet about all of it because they, they're so adamant about protecting their belief system that they lose the opportunity to just learn about someone else's epistemology. We find purpose through communication, so that has to continue. Like you, if everybody just continued to communicate in an open way, the number of problems that would be solved are immense. <laughs> The key to leadership really is to lead by example. My God, the great generals in history led from the front. You don't lead from behind your troops. You get out there on the horse, you pull up your sword, and you charge at the enemy. And you say, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more. And that's the kind of spirit that I want to tap into. And I, I feel it's, it's what's necessary for me now. I don't really feel that I have much to lose because I have faced death in my life. I still have only a 27% chance of survival. My cancer could come back at any moment. 
and um, you know, it could go to my liver, it could go to my lungs, and my doctors have said to me, if that happens, we can't do anything for you, you will die. Okay, so what am I gonna do with the time I've been given? I'm going to polish my sword, I'm gonna mount my horse, and I'm gonna charge at the enemy, and I'm gonna try to build something new.